Hello and welcome. This video series is about SegWit transactions. We will try to understand how SegWit works by creating a SegWit transaction using Python 3.6 and some basic cryptographic libraries. Now, this series does assume some basic understanding on how Bitcoin works, but I will do my best to make those videos as accessible as possible to newcomers and to beginners. And I hope that by the end of this tutorial, you will gain better understanding on what Bitcoin transaction really is, what type of information is required in order to generate a Bitcoin transaction, where to find most of the relevant information and documentation, how to process that information, and how to serialize it. Because the process of generating a SegWit transaction is quite convoluted, and because the documentation is kind of all over the place, I've tried to create few visual aids that I hope will help us to go through the process of generating our transaction. In the description below, I will leave few links, both to the resources that I've created and to other resources that I will use in this tutorial. Let's try to understand what a Bitcoin transaction really is. And in a very general way, we can think of a Bitcoin transaction as some sort of a data entry, some sort of a post-it message that is published and stored on the blockchain. This post-it says something to the effect of Alice who was the owner of 0.0027 Bitcoin um, is going to give them away to Bob or more specifically, to anyone who can prove that they are in charge over Bob's private key. And this message, this is what a Bitcoin transaction really is, just a data entry on the blockchain that anyone can read, verify, process, and so on. Now, this message is written in a very specific way, and it contains some predefined information that we will try to understand and recreate in this tutorial. Over here, we can see how such a message um, looks like when it is published onto the blockchain. And we can see that it contains the following fields, n version, markers, flags, um, number of inputs, the input itself, the origin of the coins, and so on. Now, once this information is properly serialized and published to the blockchain, as we said earlier, anyone can access it. Anyone who has access to a Bitcoin client will be able to see our message, will be able to parse it, will be able to verify it, and so on. This is an example of an actual message that I took from the blockchain. And this is what it looks like in its hexadecimal form. And we can pass this hexadecimal string in accordance to those fields that we saw earlier. And later on, we will see how we can recreate those fields. Now, this ability to pass the information and to serialize it by ourselves, this is one of Bitcoin's greatest aspect. Anyone can pass a transaction using their own tools. And just imagine for a minute that you are an app developer and you want to create some app that reads information from the blockchain and shows your user um, only specific fields that they care about. Or maybe you're trying to build the next WeChat, only this time it will be open source and it will not have the Chinese government behind it. And you can achieve those things using Bitcoin because it is not only international, it is also completely open source. We are trying to create a SegWit transaction and we have a general understanding, a general concept of what a transaction looks like on the blockchain. Now we should start getting ready to actually create our transaction. And in order to do so, the first thing we should do is to gather the necessary information. The information that we will use to create our transaction. And this is where this convoluted flowchart comes into play. Every upper node in this chart represent some input, some piece of information that we will use in order to generate our transaction or our post-it message. This type of information can be divided into two main categories, on-chain information 
and off-chain information. On-chain mostly refers to a previous transaction. It is basically information about the origin of the coins that we are about to spend. And this information, as we said, point to a previous transaction on the blockchain. That means that anyone that can access the blockchain, anyone with an access to a Bitcoin client, can gather this information directly by passing the blockchain. In our example, we can see that we received 0.00135 Bitcoin from Alice. So the input value will be 0.00135 Bitcoin. We will prove this by pointing to a previous transaction in which Alice gave us those Bitcoins. The second category is information that isn't accessible on the blockchain. This is the private key that we will use to sign our transaction and to generate our witness field. We will talk about this in more detail uh, later in the tutorial. Also, we need to decide by ourselves um, some information about the output of our transaction. Who will be the recipient of the coins? How many coins we are going to send? What will be the minor fees that we are about to provide? And so on. Now, this information is, of course, isn't yet accessible on the blockchain, but it is still crucial for us in order to generate our transaction, because at the end of the day, this will be part of the information that we will sign. Now, this off-chain category also contains some technical fields, such as N version, marker, flag, and so on. These fields affect the way in which other clients might try to parse and to understand our transaction. And later in this tutorial, we will have a better look on those fields. Okay, so now that we have a general understanding of where we can find the relevant information, either on the blockchain or by um, generating it by ourselves, we can have a look at the rest of our flowchart and follow the steps that are required in order to generate our transaction. The best place to start working on our transaction is by starting with this right part of the flowchart over here. And this is the part that is required in order to generate our witness field. Now, also pay attention that some information that we are going to gather and process here might be used multiple times. The sequence field, for example, is used three times. Two times when creating the witness field and one more time when creating the final transaction. So always keep it in mind, some fields will be used more than once. Okay, it is finally coding time, but there is just one more thing that I want to do before we can actually start to follow the flowchart. This is something that I usually avoid in my tutorials, and that is to define a function. Usually I try to keep the code as uh, procedural as possible. But in this case, there is the process of hashing that repeats itself six times during the creation of the segwit transaction. So in order to avoid repeating this process six times, I will create the only function in this tutorial. And this function will be the double SHA-256. This function will use the hashlib library. So import hashlib, and you are going to define it as the SHA-256. It will take raw information. It will hash this information using the hashlib uh, method SHA-256. It will digest the result, and then it will repeat this process with the result of the first hash, and it will return it to the user. I hope that you won't be surprised to know that in order to generate a Bitcoin transaction, you should have some coins that you can control with your own private key. I've sent few coins to a SegWit address that I have the private key for, and those coins in those transactions will be the one that I will be spending in this tutorial. Now, if you are not sure how to generate a Bitcoin address that you can control with your own private key, please watch my previous tutorial on keys and addresses. And once you have created a SegWit address, in this example, it is a nested pay to script hash 
they to witness public key hash, a version zero type of address, then send few um, coins to that address. And I would actually recommend to use a very small amount, no more than five or 10 uh, US dollars worth of Bitcoin, because we are dealing with raw code and there is a great chance that you will make a mistake along the way. So it is good to make sure that you are not dealing with your real wallet, that the worst case scenario will be that you will lose five or 10 um, US dollar worth of Bitcoin and no more than that. Okay, so this is it for the introduction. In the next videos, we will actually start to work on our code and I'll see you then. Thank you for watching.